So Rick, you started your career as an adjuster working for insurance companies, and then you now work as what, what is called a public adjuster, which almost puts you on the other side of the table with uh, the customer as opposed to with the insurance agent. Because you, when you worked for the insurance company, you, you were working on their behalf and, and, and again, you're not trying, that doesn't mean that they're doing anything wrong. They're just, their interpretation of a very complicated contract is, is going to be derived more in the, the viewpoint of the insurance company. Whereas, as a public adjuster, your interpretation of a very complex contract is, is going to be in the eyes of the, 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 the customer. Right, it's, it's the per person who holds that policy. Like. Well, let me start with this. There are three types of adjusters. There are staff adjusters who work directly for the insurance company. Mm -hmm. There are independent adjusters. Are those the guys, are the staff adjusters the guys that when I call the insurance company make a claim, they're the ones that come out and climb on the roof and they walk around the property? Is that a staff adjuster? That's, that, that would be a staff adjuster. A lot of carriers still are bulked up with employees that do that. By and large these days, a lot of companies have gone to the second type of adjuster, which is an independent adjuster or an IA. Mm -hmm. And an IA is a third party gotcha. that is hired by the They're insurance contractor. company. They're a contractor. But they still represent the interests of... They still work for the insurance company and are bound to handle claims by the insurance company's guidelines and procedures. Mm -hmm. The third type of adjuster is what we do, which is a public adjuster. It's a strange name. It should seems like it should maybe be private adjuster, but the fact is we work for the general public or for the policyholders, and we advocate on their behalf, and we protect their financial interest, which as we know, homes and businesses are some of the biggest purchases that our clients ever make in their life. So it's important after they've suffered a loss that their property be repaired as it should be, and we serve as an expert source to review people's claims paperwork and ensure that they've been taken care of and paid everything and indemnified as they should be under the terms of the policy. And, and, and you know, here's what here's what I'd like to say. One, public adjusters don't work for free, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing that I would say is, and I think you would agree with this, is if you have filed a claim and you have an adjuster come out and they make a, a, you know an assessment of the damage and and give you an offer uh, for settlement of those damages and you're happy with that I think you would say in most instances you're not needed we're not and there are yeah. plenty of times that that happens that yeah. we're not needed and I tell we, we review it and tell them, no, they took care of you really well. We right. do have those instances, and those don't need a public adjuster. But on the other hand, in many instances, there are things that are disputed. There are issues that are disputed. There are uh, uh, what I would call uh, contractual uh, complications, if you will, that create opportunities for interpretation that many times present an opportunity for you to help be an advocate for uh, a homeowner and or a business owner in the process of administering a claim. That's correct. Uh, one specific thing that we're already hearing and seeing on some of the estimates is a lot of the carriers are wanting 30% of the shingles to be blown off a slope before they write to replace that slope. Mm -hmm. If there's a slope next to it that has zero off of it, their interpretation is that only replacing that one slope will be a good repair. That's not necessarily our position because you could have wind lifted shingles uh, with debris underneath them now that are never seal, never sealed properly. There are instances and things that we look at to combat some of those guidelines. And that level of specificity is not in any insurance policy. That's just claims handling procedures. That's just a procedure. And that's where, that's where you would present yourself as an opportunity. And, and how, are, how is your company compensated for the work that you do on behalf of 
either a homeowner or a business owner. We're compensated through a contingency fee contract, mm -hmm. a small percentage of what's collected, or, or if we increase the settlement, a small percentage of the increase. The original money doesn't come into play when we come in after your property's already been inspected and estimated. As you know, there are several clients that we have though, uh, mostly commercial clients who have businesses to run and, and, and on top of personal dwellings, you know, to, to uh, employees and themselves have damage that they're trying to deal with. We can come in from the beginning and manage that entire process. In other words, we take that burden completely off whether it be a school superintendent, a banker, right. a, a pastor, right. whatever that may be, we take all of that burden because it's important to remember that in an insurance claim, it is the policyholder's burden of proof to prove the damages. It's not the carrier's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yes, they come out and they identify what they see and they'll document accordingly. By the same token, the policyholder's the expert on their property. Yeah. They know what was there, what wasn't there, et cetera. When the contractor actually starts the repairs, we can still go back or they can still go back and present additional damage found. Or if you have someone like us that comes and review the settlement, we can advise on particular items that could have been missed. Yeah. And those are called supplemental damage claims. There is a two year statute of limitations on damage from an event. And so back to the marathon sprint analogy, it's okay to take your time it's okay if additional damage is found after the initial inspection. In fact, a lot of times, it's expected that that's gonna happen. You have to understand that these insurance companies, uh, they have thousands upon thousands of properties to inspect. As you might imagine, with the way economic times have been, uh, they're running lean operations these days. Mm -hmm. And so it takes time mm -hmm. to get them out uh, I have several claims that adjusters were at their house within a week. I have several claims who still haven't had an adjuster out. So it all is gonna depend to the end that insurance companies are running leaner operations these days with less people, and that's due to technology uh, and just an involvement of the insurance claims process. There are still adjusters that come out who simply aren't as seasoned or aren't as experienced as the next guy and so there are things that are missed your contractor or a public adjuster or anyone you'd bring on to review that will be able to find those we'll call them deficiencies if that's a good term uh, your contractors more is gonna find additional damage that may have been hidden from view and one thing the insurance companies preach and I agree with this from my days on that side of it is we don't want to guess. We don't want to guess. We owe it to all of the policyholders to be as accurate as possible. So if we don't know that if an item's damaged or not, we make note of it or they make note of it and always can circle back to it within the two-year statute right. Right. to identify damage that could have been missed on the original inspection. So 